following is a production of Shark Flight Media. Shark Flight Media. Shark Flight Media. Shark Flight Media. From mechs to mages, or agents to argonauts, this is the world of Chris Kennedy Publishing. This is the CKP Future Books Podcast. Welcome back, everybody, to the Future Books Podcast. We have been on hiatus for quite some time now, so uh, we're glad to come back, and our illustrious publisher, Chris Kennedy, is with us today as we start the podcast back up, and we're going to be talking about the August releases from Chris Kennedy Publishing. This is going to be a big month. I think we have six books coming out from Chris Kennedy Publishing. I have missed talking to Chris. And we're looking forward to uh, having a conversation with him for the first time in about eight months. Chris, thank you for taking time out and <laughs> coming back to the podcast. How have you been? Hey, Randy. It's it's great to be here. I've uh, been looking forward to getting back together again. I'm, I'm glad we're able to uh, put this back on the schedule and get things going again so that we can get the word out to folks Um all the great stuff that we have coming. And, and like you said, yeah, there are, there are six books, uh, here next month. And, uh, for, for those people that, that read in German, there's another nine on the, the German side. So it's, it's a, a really busy month for us, but, uh, that, that means it's a really good month because we've got a lot of great stuff coming. You're going to have to, at some point, put up on the Facebook page, at least to those of us that are associated with CKP how you get 29 hour days while the rest of us only get 24 hour days. <laughs> I don't sleep much. That's, that's what I would say. Uh-oh. No, that's not true. I, I do, I do work long hours though. Um, but, but it's a labor of love and, uh, you know, it's not really work when you're having fun. Well, I can't understand how you can both publish all the books that you get out every month now in multiple countries and also write as many books as as you write. I'm on track for uh, writing 750,000 words uh, this year, three quarters of a million. Wow. It's just, it's all about being disciplined. Um, First thing I do in the morning is I write and, you know, write three or 4,000 words. And if you do that every day, you know, over a year, you get a whole bunch of words. Well, you must have the most disciplined, the most calendarized, um, you must have one of those books that, uh, where you have your day completely planned out in two hour segments, you must block plan your entire life. (laughs) Well, I, I learned how to do that, um, as, uh, in the military. And, and then when I got to, uh, being an elementary school principal, I, I tried to do the same thing, but, but there was never a day in five years of doing that where, the day ended up going the way I thought it was going to be right before it started. Um, so I'm, I'm now the master of uh, going with the flow. Um, you know, I, I think I know what I'm going to do for the day. And uh, once, once we meet the enemy, you know, all bets are off. So let's talk a little bit about the books that are coming out in the month of August. We're starting the month of August with a book from an author that I'm not very familiar with, Kayla Krantz, and the book is The Council. Yeah, absolutely. And and this one is under the new mythology. Um, it's going to be one of the, the Tuesday new mythology releases because it is fantasy. It's basically a young lady who uh, never had magic, and right at the, the time that they're going to do the testing, all of a sudden finds magic. And she also finds that she has a, a backstory that nobody has told her that they've uh, they've kept from her, um, and she wants to know why. Uh, meanwhile, uh, there is danger and badness afoot, um, and she has to navigate, you know, figuring out who she is and how she fits into this um, in order to make good decisions. She hopes uh, that will help whoever she's supposed to be helping, and and you know that whole. Uh, you know, there's, there's a bit of coming of age. There's a bit of, you know, trying to figure out who you are when everybody tells you you're something else. Um, so it's, it's, uh, somewhat complicated, but, uh, it's a, it's a good tale of, uh, magic and, and it's, uh, looking, we're looking forward to getting it out. This is going to be, uh, it's a three book trilogy and it'll be August, September and October. We'll get all three of them out. So 
Um, you know, it's one of those where you can jump on and, and just, it, you can ride it all the way to the end. You don't have to worry about, Hey, is when's the next book coming? I can already tell you when they're coming. They're, they're going to be, you know, about a month apart. I looked at, uh, the cover of that novel last night and it is an arresting cover. It's very beautiful. I love the greens. <laughs> Thanks. Um, the the other ones in the series are are both uh, a lot like it, where you get you know very stunning uh, visuals on them. So that it's it's obvious to see the series goes together. The next book in our August releases will be released on August fifth. It's Cause and Effect, and it's from the Fallen World uh, series. And we haven't had many books from the Fallen World recently, so I'm looking forward to this. It's from Briscoe Wood. And uh, tell us about uh, a little bit about cause and effect. Sure. Um, this is actually going to be somewhat different uh, for the fallen world. Um, and for those of, I think most people probably know Briscoe is uh, Christopher Wood's brother. Um, so, you know, they, they talk a lot about different things going on in the fallen world. Uh, this book takes place entirely before the world falls um, to provide some backstory on, uh, well, I will, uh, you know, the, the back cover copy will, will tell you that it's the person that develops the specialist program. Uh, but there are lots of things going on there. And uh, this is basically a, a book that also chronicles the rise of the corporations uh, and some of the problems with that. Um, so it's, it's a neat look at, at a part of the fallen world that we haven't really gotten a whole lot of, uh, and provides a lot of background info that, uh, I thought was really pretty cool for how some things came about. This is going to answer a lot of questions that people have been asking for a couple of years and give us a lot of backstory on, uh, where a lot of the backstory for this whole universe came from. Right. Chris did some stuff with the uh, rise of the agent program for Obsidian. Uh, this is looking more from the Teledyne side. And folks may remember that um, Briscoe's other book deals with a, a, a person named Shay. Uh, you see him here as a baby. So, you know, the, it's going a ways back. And uh, there there's some neat things that uh, you'll get to learn about the fallen world here. Then on August 12th, we have a book that if I could have written a letter and asked the authors to write, this is the book that I would have asked for. And <laughs> if our listeners buy no other book this month, this is the book that I would tell them to save their shekels and buy this book. Um, I think you could probably triple the price of this book and sell it uh, with no problem. This is probably the best book of the year. Lion's Pride, the story of Lion and the Lion's Bar from the beginning to the end. Mm. This book almost made me have an emotion. And <laughs> I have no heart. So this is a really great book. And you teamed up with Marissa Wolf, who has written books with Casey Azell uh, and others. And uh, has written has she written a book on her own with uh, CKP? Um, she has a number that are really, really close. Um, and that's actually, I think what she's going to be doing now is finishing up, uh, her first solo book because I've been beating on her for a long time that, you know, okay, it's great that you're doing all these wonderful things with other people, but you need something that you can point to as your own. Um, and, and she's, she's doing that. She's got, uh, a new storyline that she's going to be managing in Hit World, uh, for Hit World Valkyries. Um, basically female assassins that are coming out. Um, it's going to lead off with a anthology next month in September that, that she did, um, that, that she edited. And, and then she's got some stuff of her own coming. She's got a fallen world book. She's got a four horsemen book. She's, she's got a lot of irons in the fire. Um, and you know, we're, we're looking forward to all of them because she, Probably of, of all of the, the CKP authors, you know, I, I, I love each and every one of them. Uh, Marisa, I think, probably has, has come the furthest way, you know, as, as an author. And, and I think she really needs to start getting some of her own books out there so everyone can see just how amazing she is, you know, as, as an author on her own. Uh, not, you know, and, and not have anybody wonder, well, you know, is, 
is this Chris's? Is this hers? You know, um, she's awesome. Uh, I loved writing this book with her. Uh, we, we actually finished it in about two weeks, then uh, rolled into the book that follows World Enders, which we wrote in two weeks. You know, so it was actually less than a month. We wrote two books together because just uh, she's full of positive energy. And, you know, every day it was a matter of, well, I got 3,000. What can you do? Oh, I got five. Well, then tomorrow I'm going to get six, you know, and back and forth uh, a number of times uh, and just just had a ball writing it. Um, I think her style and my style dovetail very nicely together. Um, you know, the, the parts where uh, I may not be the strongest, she is. The parts where she may not be the strongest, I am. So, you know, our, our writing styles really went together very well and and, and turned out a book that uh, I'm going to have to agree with you. I, I'm going to actually say that this is now my favorite Four Horsemen book. Um, you know, after we finished it, I read through it and, and went, you know, I, I love this book. I may love this book more than any other book I've ever had a hand in writing. Um, that's that's how good I think it is. I went back and looked at the books that Marissa has contributed to, and I've decided that you need to team her with every author at CKP because <laughs> <laughs> every book that has her name associated with another author has been some of the best stuff that has been published at CKP. She is mm-hmm. she is outstanding. So, mm-hmm. and this is probably. I would give this pride of place of the two of the best books I've ever read from your publishing company. So I cannot stress enough. If you don't buy anything else, buy this. And this is actually one of the few Four Horsemen books that you could buy and not know anything about the entire universe as much as it's grown and and read it and enjoy it and not need to know anything else about the universe. Absolutely. And and that's uh, that is intentional. Uh, this is the first book of the Phoenix Initiative, and, and we wanted to give um, readers a, a new point of entry into the into the series, where you know people that that look at the series and go, "Oh my God, there's there's seventy books, there's eighty books. How do I ever?" We got a new start for you. Uh, we'll recap for you what what went on, you know, before, so that you've got a background. You know, if you want to go back and and read some of those books, sure. You know, love to. Oh, you you um, won't sell not, them the other just... eighty, will you? If they enjoy the book. <laughs> Well, I, I I imagine they're they're out there somewhere. People can probably find them. Um, so, but it you know it, we we really you know we've heard that uh, a few times here recently. Hey, you know, uh, I don't I don't know that I want to jump in with eighty books in front of me. Okay, we'll jump in with one, uh, and there'll be another one next month, and and there's others coming. So uh, the the Phoenix Initiative is um, very much like uh, a new start. Uh, just because of things that are happening, and and it was a, a great time to provide another entry for readers to to come on in and, and check it out. Then on August the sixteenth, we have a new novel in the Eldros Legacy. When you last heard from me, the first book was coming out from Todd Fonstock, which was a fabulous book. And uh, I have, even though you haven't heard from me, I have been keeping up with the uh, Eldross Legacy. This is a great series of books. Uh, This one is uh, Embers and Ash, and I am very happy to report that the series continues. And uh, uh, I'm very happy to say that uh, there's books coming out about every month in this series. Yeah, uh, and and that's you know I'm I've been looking forward to this point um, here for a little bit. They've they've got everything going in the right direction. They're they're getting them out. Um, they had some uh, you know some some issues at the start trying to get everybody working uh, from the same page, but that's all that's all in the past now. Um, the the sixth book, uh, which was the Forgotten King by Mark Stallings, came out last month. Uh, this is, like you said, Embers and Ash by Marie Whitaker. This is the seventh book. This is now all of the uh, core authors have, have got their first book out. Uh, the Eldros Legacy was a, a group effort by five different authors. They've, they've included a bunch of secondary authors, people that are going to come in and write additional stories to help flesh out uh the, the different lands. Um, but, but this, uh, with embers and ash, uh, completes, 
uh, the the initial first book in each of the five different areas. So looking forward to having this out. Um, and this one took a little while to, to get out, but I, I know that uh, the the delay has made it um, a much stronger ser- or much stronger book in, in a stronger series um, because they they were able to go back and, and align some things um, and, and really make this a super series. Um, Todd Fonestock has two books out now. I don't know if you saw that. He also has Lorella the Dark. Um, and, and he's well into his third book. Um, all of the other authors are putting together their, their next round. Uh, I think after Embers and Ash, we've got a couple of the, um, the, the secondary authors coming in with some great stories. So if you haven't tested out the Eldros legacy, you, you really, this is a great time to do it. Um, because it's, it's really going to grow quickly from here. And, and the stories they're telling are just great. Um, you know, the last, last months, the Forgotten King, um, was the, the legacy of dragons and, and who doesn't love dragons? Um, so, you know, it's, they're, they're really full steam ahead right now and, and you're going to want to check this one out. Then we will be talking with Kevin Ikenberry in the second half of our podcast this month. He's going to be our featured author. We have spoken with him in the past, but this month is special. We're going to be re-releasing his very first novel, Sleeper Protocol. Uh, He's going to be speaking with us about that. And um, it's going to be released on August the 19th. Uh, Tell us about the re-release. Sure. Um, Kevin got out the first couple books in this series. This uh, this is a trilogy. Uh, CKP has picked them all up. The, The first two books were released. But uh, the the publisher that had them originally was a science fiction publisher, and then kind of once they got the first one out, kind of went a different direction, um, which which kind of left them hanging, and and they made some uh, curious decisions on pricing and in marketing, um, and and Kevin uh, was able to get the rights back after uh, a long discussion with them. Uh, and, and he was looking for a new home and I said, Hey, I, I want them. Um, and, and the third book's done. So this is going to be another rapid release where, you know, it's, they're going to be about five weeks apart. So it, if you haven't read it, um, this is a great time to jump in. Uh, this was his, like you said, first series, but it, it also is, is his baby. And, and he worked on this one for, for a long, long time to get it right. Um, and, and he has worked on the second and third, uh, one of the things with the re-release, uh, some of the, the errors, uh, typos and things that were in the first round, uh, are now fixed. Uh, so it's a much smoother book. It's much cleaner. Um, and, and it's a great story. Well, we're looking forward to that. And with the success that he's had with, uh, the books with CKP, I can't wait to see how he started. So uh, I'm looking really forward to uh, the release of uh, Sleeper Protocol under the CKP publishing. And then we finish out the month with Darkness Rising, which is a new science fiction novel by William Frisbee Jr. So tell us about that. Oh, absolutely. And people hopefully will remember his name from Gods of War. Uh, because this is the second book in the Last Marine series. Basically, a uh, group of Marines uh, were were on a trip to uh, one of the Marine one of the moons of Jupiter, and uh, their ship got hit, and they just kind of went, you know, <laughs> went into orbit for a long time, uh, a couple hundred years, um, and and during that time, society changed. Uh, they were all in a, a stasis, uh, sleep stasis. Um, and they're now woken up uh, to find that everything that, that they pledged their allegiance to uh, no longer exists. And they have to not only save humanity, but uh, figure out, you know, how to how to honor their vows. Uh, anybody that knows um, Marines knows that the Marines take their oaths very seriously. Uh, you know, Semper Fi, always faithful. Um, so these these Marine Raiders have to figure out. You know, who are they supposed to be faithful to and, and how do they do that? Um, and it's it's a neat series. It's a very gritty series. Uh, I really like it. Uh, 
this one we have uh, six books in it already. The author's working on the seventh, I think. Um, so, you know, like, like the others, they'll be coming out about every, uh, five to six weeks apart. This one is, you know, even better than the first one. Uh, I think that if you haven't taken a look at the last Marine series, you're, you're doing yourself a disservice. Uh, jump in and take a look at it. I was fortunate enough that, uh, you sent me a copy of the last Marine, the first books, uh, in the series, uh, to read before you picked it up. And, I, I will uh, second your opinion. It is a very gritty series, but um, that novel takes a perspective that uh, isn't your normal science fiction, space opera, war series. It's uh, much more visceral, and um, the two opposing forces that the Marines wake up to are so dynamically opposed. They They are so polar opposite there is no common ground uh between the two of them uh there, and there can't be and there can't, they, they absolutely there can't be common ground uh they're they're both working for the destruction of the other and and that's the only permissible thing in their minds uh and, and, so, and you can so draw trying some... to figure out where yeah where where do you fit with these two that that you know promise to destroy the other uh, so it, it, you know, you can draw some conclusions from these novels by taking uh, some of the things that you observe in today's society, and if you just extrapolated them to their logical conclusions, if you just ran them forward as far as they can go. So this is a this is a really interesting series, and and I would recommend it to anybody who's listening, uh, who who enjoys a military who enjoys military science fiction. Uh, this is something that you may not have seen before, and it's very well written. So um, it, it it gets my seal of approval also, the, and which is what I wrote the, to you when you sent it to me. Absolutely. And the second book, um, if you like the first one, you're going to love the second um, because, you know, the, the first one takes care of all of the world building that, you know, that that you have to do at the beginning. The second one is just right into it. And, and it just goes, 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 goes. Um, so, you know, it, you're, you're gonna, you can't go wrong with this book and, and, and I'm, uh, really enjoying it. I'm just about finished with the, the final read on it and I'm looking forward to getting it out. Take a minute as a publisher and, um, uh, draw some, uh, parallels because most of the books, let's, let's, let's be honest. Most of the books that CKP publishes, we tend to look at a book and s see if it has legs to support more than one book uh, mm -hmm. in a series. Uh, you know, is, is it series worthy? Like a TV show, tell the readers why a first book in a series is generally not the strongest book. Yeah, like like I said, it's it's the world building. And, and you know, the, it's a matter of getting the world building right. Um, you need some. You need to be able to, to insert yourself into the universe but without so much that you're just bogged down with it. And, and even, even then, you know, it, if you're having to put in a lot of world building, um, you know, for something that is very, very different than the way things are right now, um, then it just, you know, it, it slows the, the book a little bit, um, you know, for, for a good story, it won't slow it much and, and you'll, you'll be, you know, right there with the author. Okay. Yep. Needed to know that. Yep. That's great. That's great. Um, but, but sometimes, you know, that it is a slower, you know, it's slower because of that. Um, and you look to see, you know, you know, do I, at the middle, do I still want to be here at the end? Do I still want to know more? Um, I would say that, that this one, certainly the answer is yes. Uh, I just pulled up the, the reviews of it and, uh, there are, uh, 59 reviews of Gods of War. Uh, 83% of them are five star. Uh, another 10% wow. are four star. So, you know, 93% satisfaction rate. Um, you know, there's, there's the obligatory, you know, Every book CKP puts out, I, we have a hater out there somewhere that that comes by within the first week and slaps a one star on it, uh, with with no review or anything. It's just they come by and, and rate it with a one star. 
just so you know we we know that they still exist and we love them well i think larry korea has one of those too so we'll take that as a point oh, yeah. of pride hey, <laughs> right anytime anytime you're doing good things and and selling lots of books you get the frustrated author or the just you know some sort of hater that that has to come and and let let you know that they hate you okay that's fine that's that's how we know that we've got a good book because you know the the haters come by and hit it with a one star uh, I, I think that was one of the one of the things that made the Four Horsemen books so good was the fact that you were able to spread that first novel, that first book across four books, that world building yeah. across four books. Uh, and very few authors are able to, to have the luxury of doing that. Absolutely. Um, agree with you. And does this one, is this one just a, a touch slower because of the world building? Perhaps. Um, but you know, the, the second book, you know, with all of that out of the way, you're, you're just go, go, go from, you know, the, the very beginning. Well, then I can't and, wait to get and, my hands and that's, on it. <laughs> and that's the way the rest of the series goes. So, you know, come on board, give it a read and, and, you know, hang on. Cause here we go. That wraps up our, August releases, and uh, it's been a while since we've talked. Uh, you've had two, well, we've had two, we've got two things to talk about at uh, the end of the podcast uh, that aren't book release related. Uh, one is Factory Con is, is getting close. Uh, are we about, uh, have we got all the logistics about taken care of? I, I think so. Um, Factory Con is October 21st to the 23rd. Uh, it is in the, the mighty metropolis of Point Jock, North Carolina at uh, the KOA uh, West Currituck. Uh, I think that all of the cabins are sold out. Uh, I think there may be one or two uh, rental RVs still. There's a couple uh, RV spots still left if you have an RV and want to come. Uh, I just put just reserved the three boats uh, that we're going to be doing the fishing trip on. Um, we've got three that are all going out deep to the, uh, Gulf stream. So we should be coming back with some, some great eating. Uh, you know, we've got people in charge of the potluck on Saturday, uh, the fish fry on Thursday. We've got, uh, food, a barbecue food truck on Friday night. Um, you know, everything's, everything's coming together. Been working with the, the KOA. They're excited to have us back. Uh, they loved us last year. They're going to love us even more with more of us, uh, this year. Um, you know, so it's, it's going to be a great time. Uh, for those of you that are unfamiliar with Factory Con, it, it started out as the end of year party for, that I threw for the authors. Um, when we moved from Virginia Beach to, uh, Coin Jock, uh, we didn't, we no longer had a place to hold it. We had been holding it at our house. Now we're in a smaller house and there are no, um, no hotels within 45 minutes. So we're, we're doing it at the, uh, the KOA. And, and that's, you know, since we were doing that, we opened it up to readers. Um, and last year we had probably about 50, 50, uh, readers and, and authors. Um, and, and we'll probably have even more, uh, readers this year. So if you're interested in, in meeting and hanging out with the authors and, and just having a great weekend, uh, this isn't a con in the um, sci-fi con mode where there are panels and things like that. This is just hanging out, doing things together, and, and having a great time. That sounds great. And then, you know, we were talking earlier about your 29-hour days. I heard that uh, you're giving up your part-time job and you were turning uh, turning in your hard hat and giving up your general contractor's license. That finally the building <laughs> the building is about done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the epilogue. Um, we we call the house the final chapter or or the last chapter. Final just kind of sounds wrong, uh, but but that was the the last house that uh, I keep saying it's the last house I'm ever going to buy. Um, so if that's the last chapter, uh, what's this uh, what's this thing out back? Well, that's the epilogue. Uh, so that we had a shed. Uh, it was built in 1953, cinder block. Uh, not doing a whole lot, so we uh, we finished it, upgraded it, and uh, it's it's been a battle with uh, the county for you know trying to get inspections and things like that. And uh, as if anybody is is doing projects now, they'll know that uh, the prices on materials have doubled or tripled uh, over the last year, and so it it's it's gotten more expensive, it's gotten hard. 
but uh, this past week we were finally able to to complete it and get uh, the final approval from the county. So you know now we're we're doing the the final uh, setup and decorating and stuff like that. Um, and and I'm really really happy to to have that done. Um, that was that was something that uh, was was in the back of my mind every single morning when I sat down to write. You know what's what's going to go on with it today. Um, so it's it's great to have that done you know and behind me is it true that and, the, and have it be usable now too is it true that the lock is on the outside so that when you put an author in there they don't <laughs> they're not allowed to come out until until the book is done you're, you're not supposed to tell them that <laughs> well the reason i'm asking is I, I thought i got at least one vote a year on who gets to get put in there <laughs> ah, okay. Well, you know, as as the number one slush reader, uh, you know, you you probably do. You know, who do you want? To, who do you want to see in there first? Well, it's going to be probably right now. It's going to be a toss up between John Sears and Marissa. Hmm. Okay. Those are or good maybe choices. the two of them together. Wow, that would be a team up. That would be an interesting, interesting team, huh? Ooh. Hmm. I'll have to suggest that. <laughs> you know the boss. Yeah, I do know the boss. Well, That'll be interesting. We'll see. I think that's a good place to stop. Chris, I look forward to talking to you in September. Hey, I look forward to talking with you. Uh, we've got a huge month in September. Um, lots of great stuff coming. All right. Talk to you in September. Thanks, Chris. You bet. Bye-bye. And for the second half of the podcast today, we are fortunate to have Kevin Eikenberry I consider him the dean of the authors of Chris Kennedy Publishing. Uh, he has written in almost every major universe that is published by Chris Kennedy. The Four Horsemen universe, Murphy's Lawless. Um, he has written in the Fallen World universe, uh, most of the anthologies. He is one of my favorite authors, um, and we are glad to have him back today. He is re-releasing uh, a book that was originally uh, his second book, and uh, he's finishing a trilogy that was uh, originally released back in 2015. The first book was Sleeper Protocol, and it's going to be re-released under CKP Publishing on the 16th of August. Sleeper Protocol by Kevin Eikenberry. Thank you for coming and talking to us today, Kevin. Hey, thank you, my friend. It's always good to be here with you. Uh, tell us a little bit about Sleeper Protocol. So Sleeper Protocol was the second book that I ever wrote. It was my debut novel, so it was the first one that sold. Runs in the Family sold uh, within a couple of months after Sleeper Protocol did. But this was a book that it's it's not my traditional military science fiction. It kind of goes there as, as the story goes on. But this is a story of a soldier from our time who wakes up 300 years in the future without his identity. And he's given one year to wander the world and figure out who he was, but he also has to figure out if that future world is worth saving. So there's a, a lot of me in this book. There's a lot of, uh, I, I would say, more science fiction thriller kind of aspects to it. And it was something for me that re it was really transformative for my writing career because I really learned to understand story structure and appreciate it in the, the writing of this book. And it really changed how I approached writing overall. So... It, it was kind of a game changer for me, and I'm really glad to, to have it coming back to print with uh, CKP. Uh, it, it's been a long road with this particular series. I won't get into the, the, the business inner workings and whatnot, if you will, but being able to, to get the rights back to the series and bring it back to readers is a huge piece. Well, we're looking forward to it. I ha actually have an original paperback copy of this book, so... Uh, I'm looking forward to getting the third book of the series uh, when when it's uh, re-released under CKP to finish the trilogy. Um, I remember Runs in the Family also. I can't believe that you've been writing for six years and have 20 novels under your belt. How how does it feel to, to write 20 novels in six years? It, it doesn't feel possible in a way. <laughs> But, you know, at the same time, and it's something that I, that I talk to people about when I teach my story structure classes, when I've really learned how to, to take story structure and make it work the best for me, I was able to, to bring my writing time per novel down significantly. So when I wrote Runs in the Family, uh, that was the first novel I ever tried to write, and it was uh, an absolute mess. 
And by the, by the time it was published, I ended up losing multiple chapters off the front, and uh, I, I just I didn't really understand how things worked. And so that one took me 18 months. And I decided when I was ready to, to with the idea for this book that I wanted to try to do something different. So I, I made it a point to learn about uh, story structure and with the help of a, a, of a good mentor, I really got an idea of how all this works. And then I was actually able to, to translate that into writing the first draft of Sleeper Protocol in about two months. And, you know, pretty much now up to, uh, up to this day, I'm able to average a novel every three, or mo- every three months or so if that's what I'm uh, choosing to do. So it really makes a difference. And then you can kind of figure out that, yeah, if I do I'm a novel every three to four months at the most, then I can, I can crank out a couple a year, and that gets me to the, the 20 part that I'm at now, which is kind of mind-blowing in a way. That takes a lot of discipline. And you're talking about um, story structure and discipline and writing. Uh, a couple of months ago, you released a book under CKP that, as far as I know, is your first nonfiction novel, The Mercenary Guide to Story Structure. Uh, I think it's a guide to learning how to write and write effectively. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. So what I wanted to do with The Mercenary Guide is that there are a lot of ways that you can structure a story. and it kind of depends on what actually resonates with the individual writer as to which one works the best for them. And in some cases, it, it's going to be kind of a, a a hodgepodge, if you will, of the different structures. And what is the, the one of the big things that trips up writers is when they start talking about structure, they start looking into things like plot, and they start looking into significant events in the plot. And they recognize that one plot structure calls it one thing, and a different plot structure calls it something else. But they know it's the same thing, but because of the different contexts provided by the story structures themselves, it gets confusing. And what I wanted to do with the story structure guide is just to kind of sit down and say, okay, here are some of the major structures, and here are some of the things about them that are very similar. Because once you understand that the the stories and the different structures have similar beats, right, or significant events that happen as part of the plot, you can understand that how those story structures work, and they play on different things. You know, for example... One of the, the more popular story structures of the, the 20th century and such has been seven-point story structure. And seven-point story structure is very good to move your plot from place to place. And then if you look at the structures like Hollywood Formula, Hollywood Formula is, is designed to look at your emotional connection to the, the reader or the audience. And you would think just by me describing those two that they would be very different. And the reality is they're almost exactly the same thing. And if you understand how to apply the context for those, you're then able actually to move your story along from place to place and give it an emotional resonance that the reader appreciates. And then they become invested in the characters and the storyline overall, which is, as an author, what we want our readers to do. That's fascinating. I don't, I don't even have any question to go with that. That's that's <laughs> that's just that's concise and and answers every question. Um, it, it, it really is it, when you when you delve into this a little bit, and that's and that's kind of what I did with the construction of the mercenary guide for story structure is just to, to really get into what are the nuts and bolts of this and how does it work. And like I said, through my experience learning these these different things and being able to apply them really affected the way that I write now. So that when I when I'm sitting down and, and writing a story. I'm constantly looking at those structures and those different contexts to drive me through what I'm trying to do and being able to to still keep the the coherency of a story that you need to, to actually make it work. I'm I'm a huge sports fan and particularly I'm I'm a huge football and basketball fan and I liken you to a dual contract basketball player in the in, in the NBA. You are a player that are play, that is playing in the G League and the NBA at the same time. You're publishing a lot of books for CKP, and you're now publishing for Bain Books. You've been published with uh, the Freehold series for Mike for Mike Williamson, who, which is a series I love, uh, and uh, you have a novel coming out also in just a couple of days. Uh, in a universe that uh, I particularly love, uh, the City Shard series, The Crossing. So tell us about this, because I have been waiting with bated breath for this series. So The, the Crossing was one of those things that, uh, as, a, as a young writer, right, when I started writing in 2009, 2010, 
I would capture different ideas in my notebook and such. And one of the ideas that I captured one day was, what if the coin that George Washington reputedly threw across the Delaware prior to the Battle of Trenton was a bicentennial quarter? Hmm. And I had written that down because, and I, and I just put, I posted this on Facebook today. Uh, a funny story that when I was probably five or six years old at the most, I swore up and down to my parents that I was there when George Washington crossed the Delaware. And it's kind of become a running family joke. And it's always been something where I have, every time I've found a bicentennial quarter, I've held on to it for a while. And so I've got one that's been sitting here on my desk since I started writing The Crossing several years ago. And I, I had this idea, and it was something that I, you know, I was, I had written Sleeper Protocol at the, at the particular point in 2014 where I met Eric Flint, and I was getting ready to do the final edits on Sleeper and send it out to try to sell it to a publisher. And I had the opportunity to have dinner with Eric Flint at the Superstars Writing Seminar, which is a, it's a business focused seminar for writers. So most writers go to different workshops and seminars. And they focus on the craft of writing, how to create characters, how to do a plot, that sort of thing. Superstars is different because it focuses on the business aspect and like how to read contracts, how to negotiate with Hollywood, those types of things. And as the, over the course of the seminar, I had the opportunity to have dinner with Eric. And as we had dinner, I realized that he was just such a phenomenal guy. And I wanted to, to learn more from him. And we're at the end of the dinner, we're standing up, putting our jackets on, and I'm standing right next to him. And I just turned to him and I said, I have this idea, and I think it could be something about alternate history, but I don't know how to write it. And Eric, you know, he, he, he's only been gone like a, a little bit more than a week or so. But every time I talk about Eric, I have to do it in Eric's voice. And he looks at me and goes, well, what's your idea? And I and I told him, I said, well, what if Washington threw a bicentennial quarter across the Delaware? And his eyes lit up. And he says, let's go to lunch tomorrow. And so I went from this this idea that I had, and I wasn't sure how to do it, having lunch the next day with Eric Flint to talk about what makes this actually work. And that started the process to, to get to where Eric eventually asked me for a manuscript. And so I wrote the, the manuscript of The Crossing. Uh, with his tutelage, and then he was the editor for the book. And when he got it and submitted it to uh, Bain, Bain was uh, gracious enough to offer us a contract, and it kind of went from there. So it's it's been a, a a long road. I think Eric and I first talked about the uh, the book in 2014, but to, to finally have it coming to uh, print in the next couple of days is it's really pretty phenomenal. I, I, it really is. I, there's not much more I can say about it than it's kind of mind blowing that it, it's coming to print at this point. Well, I, I want to say congratulations to you, and uh, I can't think of anything that I would be prouder of. It's a great universe to be able to ride in, and I can't think of a better person to to be a mentor. He was a phenomenal guy. I, I, I was fortunate enough to meet him and talk to him several times over the years and um i can't think of a, a of a better person and uh he's going to be sorely missed I, I, indeed he will you know I, we were talking the other day that uh i don't know that there are many authors besides him who have done so much for other writers you know being able to to give seminars like at superstars and other places uh, eric, eric flint taught me how to read contracts so you know, he, he gave this, he would give a class at Superstars about contracts and he would take one of his Bain books contracts completely unredacted. So everything was, was there and you could see everything. And he would go by it clause by clause and walk you through what was, what was good and what was bad or what, you know, what you needed to look for. And at the end of the class, he gave uh, an offer to everyone of, you know, if you get a, a contract that you're not comfortable about, send it to me and I'll read it and I'll give you my feedback on it. And so when I had sent out the, the when I sent out Sleeper Protocol the first time, I actually I had a nibble from a publishing company, and they were interested, and they sent me a contract, and I read the contract, and there were a couple things that made the hair on the back of my neck stand up, and I thought this this doesn't look right. So I sent Eric an email, I'm like, "Hey, were were you really serious about this offer you made?" <laughs> and he writes back basically, "Send me the damn contract." So I I send him the contract, and he writes me back, and he says. Don't sign this contract, but here's why. And it ended up being about six pages of master's degree level work 
about how to actually go through and read and understand a contract. And it was phenomenal. So that when I got this, the initial contract on Sleeper Protocol, when I read it, I was like, this is a good contract. And it was kind of funny because I, w- I was going to send it to Eric again for his comments, but he was out of the country. And so I ended up sending it to my friend Kevin J. Anderson, and, and Kevin was uh, in agreement with me that it was a good contract and I should go ahead and sign it. So uh, Eric was uh, uh, one of a kind. You know, he was uh, my mentor. Uh, I'm immensely grateful to him for all of the things that he taught me. Uh, he was my friend. You know, we had the opportunity on multiple occasions to go to conferences and conventions and, and sell books with one another. And there was always a fun conversation. We always kind of kind of gave each other a little bit of grief. He would get on me for imitating his voice, but then he would tell me that I did it pretty well. And then he just he he radiated uh, a love of, of writing and of the craft and of being able to help another writer at any point or any stage in their career, if there was anything that he could do, he did it. And he, like you said, he will be sorely missed. Uh, I miss my friend greatly. I, it, in a lot of ways, with the, the crossing coming out here in just a few days, it doesn't seem right that he's not here. And and it hurts a little bit, but at the same time, I know that he's got a smile on his face and he's saying, all right, when are you going to write the next book, Kevin? And, you know, that's that was Eric. And uh, I, like I said, I love him and I'll miss him very much. Well, I think that you're going to have to continue to, to hone that uh, that impression because that, that, that sounds just like him. And uh, the, I think the two things that he's going to be remembered for is his development of new writers and giving new writers a place to showcase their talents. And we, the people who get to read the books of people who would have never gotten an opportunity to get something in print to let publishers see how good they were owe their careers to the Grantville Gazette and to Eric Champion championing them and to to the to the writing seminars that he did. And uh the the other thing that he's gonna be remembered for is being the science fiction curm- curmudgeon that he was <laughs> and that voice is what's going to be asked for over and over again i have uh two more questions and i think i'm done i've already talked about your being published by bain and then the second thing that you're that you've done recently that i'm very envious of and it surprised me and i didn't even know they were still doing it you were able to uh do a tattered cover event and I'm sure a lot of people who are listening don't even know what I'm talking about. But the Tattered Cover is a bookstore in Colorado. And I don't know if they still are, but at one time they were the largest independent bookstore in the country. And they, at one time, averaged about one author event a day with really good authors. And uh, it was quite a cachet to be able to be an author that the Tattered Cover invited to... Uh, talk about their books. So tell us a little bit about doing an event for the Tattered Cover. So Tattered Cover is now spread to a, a multiple uh, amount of stores, and they just opened one in Colorado Springs within about the last three weeks. And as we were getting ready to, to go through the process, I got an email from them asking if I wanted to host a signing there, which, of course, the answer is yes. <laughs> um, just just like you were saying, because of their, because of their reputation, they are really – a really special organization and store, if you will, business because of the way that they reach out to to big name authors. I mean, they've had events with Neil Gaiman and they've had events with Tom you know, Clancy, Tom Clancy, and just a, a ton of a ton of authors. But they also do things which are, are incredible, even for an independent bookstore the size that they are. One of the things they have is a, a, an authors program for the authors in the state of Colorado. So if you are a an individual, indiv- uh, like an indie pressed author, or if you are doing a uh, just a, a small press or something along those lines, you can coordinate with them, and they will carry your books, which is huge to be able to actually have you shelf space as as a, a emerging author. And so they are just phenomenal. And, you know, being in Colorado Springs, I haven't had a chance to do many uh, opportunities to go up and actually see events in Denver. So when they opened the store here and they reached out to me, I was, of course, interested. And that signing is going to be on August 9th. And I couldn't be more excited because it's going to be a chance for 
some of my friends and other authors here in the Colorado area to, to actually come in, meet the staff, and potentially do their own events That's and have great. their own have their own books carried in the store, which is just phenomenal. They are tremendous. Um, if you ever pass through uh, Denver's International Airport, there's a tattered cover. I believe it's in the B concourse. Uh, in the, the middle of the airport. So if you're changing planes, you can actually stop in the bookstore and get a book. It's it's really a, a pretty cool place. And then my last question, when I was doing my research, I found an obscure book I'd never heard of before that you were a co-author of, and I just want to know what it is. Chasing Red, a Gareth Red thriller. What is this? So... <laughs> this is kind of this is one of those funny stories that ends up happening because I was I was riding in a Starbucks one day and when I when I go to Starbucks and ride I always had one that I would where I would typically go to and I still go to every once in a while and they have that the high top counter where the baristas are and so I would sit there up there and I have my my headphones on because I listen to music while I ride typically instrumentals and whatnot but I, I'm listening to my headphones one day and I'm just typing away and there's this tap on my shoulder. And I look up and I take my headphones off and this this uh, younger guy is standing there. He's got glasses and kind of a beard. He points at the screen and he says, that's Scrivener. And I was like, yeah, it's it's the program that I write in. He goes, well, I'm a writer too. And I was like, oh, what's your name? He goes, well, I, well my name is Nick Thacker. And so we, we had a chance to talk a little bit. And so uh, he leaves. I get back to work. I finish my, my work. And then before I leave Starbucks, I Google, who is this Nick Thacker guy? Well, Nick Thacker is a thriller writer. Uh, he's a USA bestselling author, and he had, he had been in Colorado Springs at that point for, I'd say, probably about a year or so. And he lived very close to where I used to live, and we became friends. And it was something where, uh, as the, the as we were talking one one time, he said, you know, I've got this this series of books, um, and I've got this, this offshoot character who's an army guy, and I'd really like to, to do a little bit more with him. And I've written a book, and I think the first one is called Seeing Red, and it follows this particular character, uh, Red Gareth. And he said, well, I would I would love to do more with this. And so I, I read the first book and I thought, oh, yeah, this is pretty cool. You know, and I wanted to I wanted to kind of extend my my chops, if you will, and do different things. So writing a modern day kind of military thriller, I thought would be a lot of fun because you know I was a huge fan of. The techno thriller phase back in the mm-hmm. '90s with you know Tom Clancy and Dale Brown and uh, Stephen Koontz and whatnot, and so I thought, well, I'd, I'd love to do this. And so then Nick and I kind of got together and said, well, let's do a, let's do a short novel. So I, I went down and uh, did a little bit of research with uh, his character, and then uh, wrote most of that particular manuscript for for Chasing Red, and I had a lot of fun doing it. And we've talked about doing a third book, and it's something that with his schedule and mine right now, it's a little bit kind of hard to get to. But being able to, to jump in and write a, a more modern-day thriller was fun, and Nick is just such a great guy that I enjoyed working with him. And it was, as, as a writer, I think the, one of the biggest pieces of advice that I give to people is to, to not try to pigeonhole yourself into one particular genre. And if you write space opera, for example, try to write something different every once in a while because it helps your chops. Mm-hmm. It helps your, your talent, if you will. And in some cases, it can actually help with your, your writer's block because every once in a while, all of us get stuck on something. And I, I have one friend who she will tell you that you know she writes urban fantasy and, and some horror. But every once in a while, she will get to a point where she can't write. So she just basically goes and writes erotica. And she never publishes it. It's, it's not something that she would ever even own up to, but it helps her kind of clear the mechanism. And I think that being able to, to do different things as a writer is going to be more beneficial to you than continuing to slog on one series or one idea or one genre. Uh, mix it up a little bit and see what happens. So uh, having the opportunity to, to write with Nick was great. And uh, I, I look forward to kind of doing more of that stuff if I can as the schedule opens up because it's, it does help you develop as a writer, and for me, it was it was great to see how uh, different I could make a story, but still keep to the same elements of story structure and be able to do something that wasn't three or four hundred years in the future, but like tomorrow. And that was fun; it really was. Well, Kevin, is there anything that you want to talk about that I haven't touched on? Uh, you know, this is I, this, I was actually just talking with my, my wife about this a, a little while ago. 
Uh, this was a year that I was not going to write a lot. I had determined that I was going to only do a couple of books, maybe three. I had the, the, the nonfiction book that was going to be one of those. And I had, uh, one, I had the redacted book that came out with Kevin Steverson, Redacted Weapon, back in the spring. I was going to do the, the Mercenary Guide to Story Structure. And then I was probably going to do just one more book because I knew The Crossing at that point was on its uh, glide path towards release on the 2nd of August. And I wanted to, to try to focus as much as I could on that. And then, you know, I ended up getting the rights back for the Protocol War. So the first two books, Sleeper Protocol and Vendetta Protocol. And then when that happened and I got those rights back, that the dam kind of broke. And I thought, well, I need to finish that third book. So I went ahead and wrote the third book, which is Eminence Protocol. And so now those three books will be starting to, to publish every six weeks starting on the, the 19th of August or 16th, 19th of August. And then in the, in the between time last year, Chris Kennedy and I started working on a, a series idea that I had had about two years ago, which kind of like the, uh, the Pacific Rim kind of feel, the big rock'em, sock'em robots kind of thing going after aliens. And it was just something that I had come up with for fun and I had pitched it to Chris and he said, I'll write that with you. So we actually have the, the first two books of that are written and they will both be out later this year. Uh, the first one is The Last Stand that Chris and I wrote together. And then the second book is called Vortex Stingray. And that's mine alone. And then Chris will write the third book. And then we'll be opening up the universe to other authors, including Kevin Steverson, who will actually write book four. So we have a, a lot of fun coming with that particular series, uh, which is going to be great. And then right now I'm working with Jason Cordova on two Four Horsemen books at the same time. Uh, on a Cloudy Day and The Misfits, which will include both uh, stories of his fan favorite character, Sunshine, and mine, Jessica, Jessica Francis. So we're going to work those two together to complete those storylines and hopefully have those released by the end of the year. It's been a, a kind of a crazy year up to this point. It just keeps getting crazier. Well, I'm glad you're taking it easy. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, I wish that were the case. It doesn't doesn't feel like it sometimes, but it's, you know, uh, like I said before, Kevin Anderson is one of my mentors, and he has a, a theory that it's kind of like, you know, throwing popcorn in a pan to, to pop it. The more you keep throwing in the pot, the more things will continue to pop. And he is very right about that, because it, it just seems like the, the more things I do, the, the more I find them coming to fruition and being able to, to, you know, reach publication or reach out to fans or just becoming reality, which is amazing. Wow. Kevin, we've enjoyed you taking time out of your schedule, especially this late, to talk to us. And uh, this is, I think, your third time on the podcast, and I can't wait until we're able to do this again. And uh, I'm super happy for you. Uh, thank you, my friend. And, you know, like I've told you before, anytime you need me, I'd be happy to, to come on and don't need to talk about my books. We can talk about other people's books if you want to. It's, uh, I love being able to, to share the philosophy that we have with uh, CKP, that a rising tide lifts all boats. And I firmly believe that you know the things that I'm able to contribute, the things that other authors are able to contribute, will end up helping us all in the long run. Well, thanks a lot, and we look forward to talking to you next time. And uh, until next time, this is Future Books. Thank you. You've been listening to the CKP Future Books Podcast with host Randall Willis. If you enjoyed this podcast, please consider leaving it a review on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or wherever you subscribe. Show likes and channel subscriptions are also much appreciated on the CKP YouTube channel. Finally, if you'd like to know more about this author or others on the CKP roster, visit ChrisKennedyPublishing.com. Thanks for listening to the CKP Future Books Podcast. We'll see you next time.